Imagine a nation where 95% of the land is unforgiving desert, where rainfall barely exists, and summer temperatures scorch past 45 degrees Celsius, yet 37 million people not only survive, but thrive. Saudi Arabia has achieved something that sounds impossible. They've built an invisible river of steel, pumping billions of liters of seawater through colossal pipelines that snake hundreds of kilometers inland, turning the ocean into drinking water. But this engineering miracle balances on a knife's edge. What happens when the machines stop? What happens when the water runs out? If you enjoy massive engineering projects and future technology, make sure to subscribe, like the video, and comment where you think this technology is heading. Saudi Arabia didn't just build a desalination plant, they bet the survival of an entire nation on Ras Al Khar, the world's largest water factory. This $7.2 billion complex sprawls across the eastern coast, producing over 1 million cubic meters of fresh water every single day. That's enough to fill 400 Olympic swimming pools, or supply 3.5 million people with everything they need to drink, cook, and clean. The scale defies comprehension. Intake pipes stretching offshore, processing halls the size of aircraft hangars, storage tanks towering overhead. But here's what nobody talks about. Ras Al Khair requires its own dedicated 2,400 megawatt power plant just to operate. That's enough electricity to power a city of 2 million people, burning continuously, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. The energy demand is so extreme that the desalination plant and power station were designed as a single integrated complex. One cannot exist without the other. High pressure pumps force seawater through reverse osmosis membranes at 60 times atmospheric pressure a process that devours electricity like nothing else in industrial infrastructure. When you build something this massive, you create a single point of failure. If Ras Al Khair goes offline, whether from equipment breakdown, power loss, or something worse, millions lose their water supply within days. Engineers understood the risk from day one, but Saudi Arabia had no alternative. With aquifers depleting and rainfall averaging less than 100 millimeters annually, the ocean became the only option. But engineers discovered a problem no one anticipated. Deep inside these steel labyrinths, invisible enemies wage war against the infrastructure. Microbiologically induced corrosion, or MIC, slowly devours pipes and critical components from the inside out. Bacteria colonies form biofilms on metal surfaces, creating acidic microenvironments that eat through carbon steel and even corrosion-resistant alloys. What looks solid on the outside becomes brittle and porous beneath the surface. Case studies from desalination facilities reveal a disturbing pattern. Sulfide contamination in offshore intake structures, catastrophic failures in seawater lift pumps, and manil bolt failures that caused entire pump assemblies to seize mid-operation. These aren't isolated incidents. They're systemic vulnerabilities inherent to any system processing corrosive seawater at industrial scale. One documented failure involved the complete breakdown of intake screens when biofouling blocked filtration systems faster than crews could clean them. Saudi Arabia's environment amplifies every weakness. Scorching desert heat accelerates metal fatigue. The Arabian Gulf's high salinity, higher than most oceans, makes corrosion more aggressive. Thermal expansion and contraction from extreme day-night temperature swings stress pipeline joints and welds. Fix one leak and pressure shifts elsewhere, opening new failures downstream. Maintenance teams operate in a perpetual race against deterioration, knowing that if they fall behind, the consequences cascade through the entire network. And the threats don't end with engineering. Forget corroding pipes. What about the enemies actively targeting them? In 2019, Iran's leadership explicitly threatened Saudi Arabia's critical infrastructure, with analysts identifying desalination plants as prime targets. These facilities are what security experts call hostages to fortune. Concentrated, visible, vulnerable to attack from air, sea, or even sabotage. A single cruise missile, drone strike, or coordinated commando raid could cripple water production for millions. The vulnerabilities multiply when you consider the offshore intake systems. Thousands of meters of exposed pipelines sit on the seabed, accessible to underwater drones or divers. An oil tanker spill near the intake could force shutdowns for weeks while contaminated water clears. Worse still, these plants operate on sophisticated industrial control systems, the exact type of infrastructure that's been successfully breached in past cyber attacks on Saudi facilities. Hackers don't need to physically reach the plant, they just need to penetrate the network and manipulate pressure valves, chemical dosing systems, or pump controls. 
Saudi Arabia has no backup plan. No rivers flow through the kingdom. No massive aquifers wait underground. What little groundwater remains is rapidly depleting. If Ras al Khair and its sister plants go dark simultaneously, the entire eastern region faces a humanitarian catastrophe, measured in days, not weeks. Urban centers like Riyadh depend entirely on pipelines pumping desalinated water hundreds of kilometers inland. Cut the supply, and the country's heartland suffocates. If this surprised you, hit like so more people see this. But there's another crisis brewing beneath the surface. This engineering miracle hemorrhages money that Saudi Arabia can't afford forever. Producing each cubic meter of desalinated water costs approximately $5, a figure covering energy, chemicals, maintenance, and infrastructure depreciation. Yet Saudi citizens pay almost nothing. Government subsidies cover more than 95% of the true cost, with projections showing the annual bill approaching $6.5 billion by the early 2020s. Why such extreme subsidies? Because Saudis consume water like it's limitless. Per capita consumption reaches 263 liters daily, more than double the global average and comparable to water-rich nations. Much of this disappears through leaky distribution networks, inefficient appliances, bot, and cultural habits developed when oil wealth made conservation irrelevant. Golf courses bloom green in the desert, fountains spray continuously in public squares. Agriculture consumes vast quantities despite the arid climate. The infrastructure itself drains resources relentlessly. Saudi Arabia's water pipeline network stretches over 5,000 kilometers, with each kilometer costing approximately 3 million to construct, not including pumping stations, storage reservoirs, and maintenance facilities. Building more capacity means digging deeper into national budgets while oil revenues fluctuate unpredictably. Economists warn the model is unsustainable. Without tariff reform, politically explosive in a country accustomed to cheap water, the system relies entirely on government spending. As population grows and demand surges, the financial burden compounds exponentially, and the environmental toll may be even worse. For every liter of fresh water Saudi Arabia produces, 1.5 liters of hypersaline brine flows back into the Arabian Gulf. This isn't slightly salty water. It's a toxic cocktail of concentrated salts, chemical additives from the treatment process, and residual anti-scaling agents, all discharged at temperatures higher than the surrounding sea. The Arabian Gulf is already one of the world's warmest, saltiest seas. It's a semi-enclosed basin with limited circulation, meaning pollutants don't disperse. They accumulate. As brine discharge increases, salinity levels in coastal waters rise beyond what marine ecosystems can tolerate. Fish populations decline, coral reefs bleach, biodiversity collapses. Scientists warn that decades of continuous discharge are fundamentally altering the Gulf's chemistry, potentially causing irreversible damage to habitats that have existed for millennia. Then, there's the carbon footprint. Desalination plants rank among the most energy-intensive industrial operations on Earth. Saudi Arabia's facilities burn fossil fuels to generate the electricity needed for high-pressure pumps and thermal processes, releasing millions of tons of CO2 annually. This directly contradicts the kingdom's stated ambitions for carbon neutrality and climate action. Researchers have proposed storing captured CO2 in waste brine before ocean discharge, potentially sequestering up to 458 million tons long-term. But the technology remains experimental, unproven at industrial scale and economically questionable. Critics argue it's a band-aid on a bleeding wound, addressing symptoms while the fundamental problem, unsustainable consumption, continues unchecked. Comment below if you think this project will succeed or fail. Yet the system keeps expanding. Demand accelerates faster than infrastructure can match. Water consumption across Saudi Arabia grows at approximately 6% annually, driven by population increase, urban expansion, and industrial development. Government plans call for doubling desalination capacity to 20 million cubic meters per day by 2030, requiring tens of billions in investment. But even this massive expansion may not suffice. Saudi Arabia's per capita water availability sits at just 89.5 cubic meters per year, far below the 500 cubic meter threshold that defines absolute water scarcity. As population climbs toward 40 million, that figure will drop further. Cities sprawl across desert landscapes, manufacturing facilities demand reliable supply. Agricultural projects consume enormous volumes trying to achieve food security goals. Each new desalination plant brings more problems. More brine polluting the Gulf, more carbon emissions threatening climate targets, more infrastructure vulnerable to attack or failure, more energy requirements straining the power grid, 
Engineers propose solar-powered desalination and renewable integration, but deployment lags behind promises. Technology advances incrementally while demand explodes exponentially. Water experts question whether building more capacity addresses the core issue, consumption that treats a scarce resource as infinite. Without fundamental behavior change, without tariff structures that incentivize conservation, the gap between supply and demand will widen no matter how many plants are built. Subscribe if you want more deep dives into future mega projects. So what happens if this system collapses? Picture the scenario. Pumps fall silent across the Gulf Coast. Screens in control rooms flash red. Within 72 to 120 hours, urban water reservoirs drain empty. 37 million people face a crisis no modern nation has experienced. Total water system collapse in a landscape offering no natural alternatives. No rain falls to collect. No rivers flow to divert. Just endless sand stretching to every horizon. How could it happen? A sophisticated cyber attack penetrates plant control systems, simultaneously disabling multiple facilities before operators can respond. Or a military strike. Cruise missiles, armed drones, targets the concentrated infrastructure along the coast. Or a cascading equipment failure overwhelms maintenance capacity during peak summer demand when systems operate at maximum stress. The consequences unfold rapidly. Hospitals exhaust emergency reserves, food production halts, hygiene collapses, social order phrase, the government activates emergency protocols, but moving enough bottled water to supply tens of millions proves logistically impossible. Regional neighbors face identical vulnerabilities. UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, all depend on desalination infrastructure equally susceptible to the same threats. Security analysts warn it's not speculation. It's a question of when, not if, a major event tests system resilience. Every day that passes without incident is borrowed time. A gamble that geopolitical tensions won't explode that cyber defenses hold, that aging infrastructure doesn't reach catastrophic failure points simultaneously. The future depends on decisions being made right now. Saudi Arabia is betting on technology to outrun the crisis. Investments pour into solar-powered desalination, aiming to slash both costs and carbon emissions. The futuristic Neom megacity project includes experimental plants designed around renewable energy and zero-brine discharge technologies, Wastewater recycling targets pushed toward 90% by 2030, attempting to close the loop and reduce ocean dependency. But technology alone won't save the kingdom. Consumption patterns must shift. Tariffs must rise to reflect true costs, despite political resistance. Agricultural policies need complete overhaul. Growing water-intensive crops in the desert makes no economic or environmental sense. Cultural attitudes toward conservation must evolve from wasteful abundance to mindful efficiency. Success could provide a blueprint for water-scarce regions worldwide as climate change intensifies droughts and depletes freshwater sources. Failure triggers humanitarian catastrophe, economic disruption, and regional instability that ripples across global markets. Will innovation conquer scarcity, or will brine-choked seas, cyber vulnerabilities, and unsustainable consumption doom the grand experiment? The stakes define not just Saudi Arabia's future, but the future of how humanity survives in an increasingly water-stressed world. If you want more stories about the technology shaping our future, subscribe to Next Blueprint, like the video, and let us know your thoughts in the comments.